And now, a native podcast with Matt and Zach. All righty, everybody. Welcome back. Episode two, numero dos. Matt Buddy, Zach here. How are you doing, Matt Buddy? Let's start it off right. I'm doing pretty good, my man. Pretty good out here in uh, Portland, Oregon area right now. And uh, this is our last day of clouds, it looks like. (laughs) The sun sun is coming, so. Good. It's summer up in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, It's great to hear. I'm excited. Uh, I'm excited for you um, and all the fun adventures you get to go on out in the Pacific Northwest. All the salmon cultures you get to see. All the the powwows out there. I think you said you're going to Celets or Grand Ronde this fall as well. Yeah. Uh, they're back to back weekends. So usually what I do, it, it, I try to like, if I go to Celets one year, I'll go to Grand Ronde the next. Uh, okay. Or if I got things going on, depending on which weekend I'm free, I'll go make a trip out of it, go camp at the coast if it's at Celets or if it's at Grand Ron, maybe stay with my buddy. He sets up a teepee every year. So, <laughs> yeah. No, that's exciting. No, it's exciting to see Indian country, Native America, North America, Turtle Island getting into it, whatever you want to call it. Um, Kind of just to get into the meat, because this episode, I think today is a meaty episode. Um, As you were saying, Um early on you know there's a lot to talk about here this is a this is a can of worms because the topic if you read the title says what is a native american and i don't know how many of you have been asked that question in your lives um or had it come up or had the discussion with someone and this is something me and matt i mean we've gone back and forth you know what is that definition but how do you how do you get the conversation even started you know we talk about like even the terminology, indigenous, American Indian, Native American, um, all socially accepted across Indian country, for that matter, I feel like you hear them, you know, indigenous, Native American, American Indian, all referenced, um, Indian country referenced, all that. So it's kind of interesting when you get into what, what that may be. Uh, Matt, any just first words? Yeah, no, I mean, that's, um, that's a that's a loaded question (laughs) i mean for real like that could go many different directions even even indian you know or like just that term it has a more negative connotation but at the same time you know you go to the res and there's elders like we're indians you know like well and that's the (laughs) official term the u.s government united states government uses is american indian you know when you fill out the census form when you look at any government data that you know like the fda publishes or uh cdc or the white house it's american indian is how they or other you know don't forget we also get looped into the other cats <laughs> other or something else or <laughs> <laughs> but that's kind of what it is it's i don't know what you are but it's interesting because you get those names and you get like modern day you see that with the youth, right? Yeah, the Gen Xers, uh, the Gen Zers, the millennials, you're starting to really see the term indigenous be used more, um, which to me comes from the Canadians, uh, just first peoples and how they they refer to themselves as indigenous is where you really, I think, where I've, where I've heard the term, I guess. Oh, yeah. And I think there there is this greater movement right now. Um, we talk about Turtle Island. Right. And I just posted something about the turtle today on Facebook and how it how the turtles like holding itself up or like it holds others up. Like it's kind of like we're all sitting on a turtle shell in North America. And that does include indigenous people in Canada, U.S. and Mexico even. And so like that now there's a movement toward the like if you're indigenous to North America, that's the term they're trying to use. Right. And then it's interesting because when you go to the museum of the uh, Native American, American Indian, right? Yeah. Cause even the Smithsonian museum of Native American, is it Native American or American Indian? I think it's American. American Indian. It's American Indian as well. Like you're saying the government uh, terminology. But yeah. In DC there, the Smithsonian, beautiful museum. They, it's interesting because there's some old, old quotes that they have where people are talking about, <laughs> 
Oh, sorry. The, the Americans referring to the native people as the Americans. Oh, you know, that's early, interesting. early on in the days, right. yeah. weeks, as you, how the terms would evolve into like Native American being common because it's saying like, no, you're native to this land that we call America. Whereas like over time, the U.S. citizens bought into, no, we're Americans because we were born here. We This is our right to this land as well. And as Manifest Destiny and all that carried out, those terminologies, it's interesting how you look at little things like that and how they're kind of used uh, throughout history and how they change and adapt over time. Because, you know, I, it, it's interesting. It's just, it, it's we call ourselves, one thing and then you know you're even seeing tribes nowadays like like the flathead tribe you're seeing them go more towards the salish kootenai terminology and away from the flathead terminology right. uh, because of just the misconceptions with language barriers and whatnot and tribes going like even we we're talking about that the jemez pueblo uh mm -hmm. like the w wapatoa is really their true name um and yeah. and how that is so there's all these different movements but regardless i think of what what you call it those kind of terms to me are what you know you'll hear are indigenous american indian native americans all kind of that indian country it's all kind of kind of one um and i like to group you know we always group alaska into it with the u.s yeah. But I also like to group the Hawaiians uh, just based on their their struggles as well, just sometimes because of how the U.S. government really did treat them um, in relations. Well, and they're and they the fact that they do get they're kind of in this weird they get left out of things. Sometimes they're included with other Pacific Islanders, but that's a whole other thing because like Tonga is its own country. But American Samoa is like the Hawaiians in a sense, their territory of the u.s so they're kind of in this weird thing but but arguably the native hawaiians they spent time along the oregon coast oh they spent it, time here on the mainland with other tribes and it's like exactly there's documentations of hawaiian bird feathers in burial mounds in ohio right. meaning those <laughs> trade, routes, trade centers exist That's 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 crazy how how far that is too and like people think well how is that possible well right here in oregon the in eastern oregon there's the owyhee river and doing research owyhee oh that sounds indigenous right well it is but it's not indigenous from there it's a hawaiian word no oh. from the early hawaiian explorers that came out to fort vancouver and they, they, you know, they basically went on, um, they, they, some of them became trappers and right. And, well, and work and yeah. Who's to say if there's feathers in Ohio, how, how does a person not end up there either? Get off the boat and start wandering and walking, you know, and learning this new land and trading. There's Blackfeet stories about going down to Mexico. Right. Well, or marrying into like other tribes. Right. And, and, yeah, yeah, there is that Blackfeet one is interesting to me because that you're talking about the eagle condor kind of thing. Right. And what's interesting about that is during the Standing Rock pipeline um, encampment, the uh, Sacred Stone Camp, I believe is what they called it. But there's a kind of like that their story came out about the eagle and condor meeting again there. Because this time there's indigenous people from down south that came to that camp. Right. To help. So like in reverse, like they came north this time because the Blackfeet went south a long, long, long time ago. Right. Right. No. Or in an individual manner, however the story was, you know. But right. Uh, people traveled a long distance. Well, and if you if anyone knows that story that Matt is referencing and wants to share that story, please give us an email at gng at gng.net. That is the letter G as in garden gnome, uh, the letter N as in gnome Alaska, uh, the letter G again, and then dot net, uh, gng at gng.net. Um, the N is also Nancy for the military code speakers and as in Nancy. <laughs> uh, let us know but i guess a good way to break down 
Indian country as a whole, when you start, you know, you get that big question, like we said, what is a Native American, right? You know, you kind of talk about the terminology, you talk about the peoples, the, the indigenous peoples, the Turtle Island, right? And I like to break it down, especially when you get into the United States here. Um, you have your Native Hawaiians, you have your Native Alaskans, you have the Pacific Northwest, which arguably ranges from Yurok, California, I would argue up to like Juneau, Alaska, even uh, when you talk about some of the salmon culture traditions, right. uh, when you talk about like the relation of like some of those Alaskan villages versus like the ones up like on the tundra, you know, it's, it's a little bit different where there's more similarities to the coastal people. Well, but yeah, go ahead. oh, uh, it, it is like you're saying that Southeast Alaska, the, the areas where it rains a lot are also a good indicator with the forest and meeting the coast is also a great indicator of what you're saying, like for coastal culture. Well, and arguably you see maps that they'll, they'll include the Flathead tribe in Montana and the Idaho tribes in that Northwest region as well. So when you look at like the Oregon, Washington, Idaho kind of Flathead and then Northern, I would include Northern California, but you could argue California own region as well as Nevada but typically I would group California and Nevada together yeah and, and you were hitting on something in the northwest is like regionally we would include like Oregon Washington Idaho sometimes northern half of California but then you look at cultural regions and those can sometimes be a little different right like plateau the Columbia Plateau, you could argue, is a combination of plains and Northwest Coast culture, like intermixed. Exactly. And, and that's arguably why that some of those Columbia Plateau tribes can come over to the Three Forks area, the Montana area, the Yellowstone area, and come hunt bison. Right. Like, because salmon was still their biggest thing, but yet they supplemented it. They had, arguably, they had a lot of options for food in that sense. But because when you look at that, they did. And in a way, <laughs> I think I think when you look at the dams, you look at the the way we suck up water off this land and kind of just hurt the land as society mm -hmm. does now. If you take Spokane, Coeur d'Alene, uh, some of those larger like Washington cities out of the McEat Tri Cities, I think that landscape looks a little bit more lush and you know. Oh when you look at like the Sahara and stuff of Africa, like, right. more, like vibrant and lush and has its true seasons and really like in August, one time I was driving back in, in Washington and I hit a bunch of grasshoppers and I'm like, back in the day, man, you can only imagine swarms like these um, and what that did to the field. Cause you're not farming the fields either. It, well, like, you saw that time of year, how dry it gets out there. Like, like when the grass and the farms are all dried up in Eastern Washington and but see, you're not pulling that much water back in the day um, yeah. for farms and stuff. So it's 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 a different landscape and it's a different type of grass even. So well, they're not tilling that soil, so the soil they probably maintains more moisture longer, like right. in greenery, like you're saying, you know. Well, and it, and to me, it created. I bet you it was an Eden of some sort. You know, when you look at that oh, region. Yeah. No, that plateau region. I mean, I've gone elk hunting in the Blue Mountains of Oregon. Right. And arguably, I'm like, why don't more people live out here? It's it's beautiful. There's no one that lives there hardly in the Umatilla peoples, you know. I'm like, wow, you guys had salmon and the mountains for hunting. Like, right. Hunting. And that's the thing is people look at that land and they it, and no one's out there. And it's like, oh, the reservation's on the shitty land. It's because like, well, yeah, the U.S. government put the reservation on the shitty land. Like, that's right. what, like, right next to the beautiful mountains, the beautiful right all that that's right probably the lands that like native folks just traveled through were like yeah we don't have any resources here so they didn't use it you know like well and when you talk about the bison and where it was even arguably out there on the columbia plateau at times that that's a field that of grass the bison would be grazing in and you just follow them through it in the in the summer seasons or in the spring falls you know season, and then you'd winter where you'd winter but you know, and then, uh, so then we look at the, like I said, the, the California region, because you have the like rancherias um, and Nevada, because you have the Indian colonies. Those are kind of similar, just how they are established and set up and kind of govern themselves. 
but it's different you know each state is different because of the state laws that yeah the tribes but when you talk about grouping them together sometimes it's easy to group nevada either into the southwest or california and the southwest i like to get into is utah arizona new mexico colorado um right. especially because those colorado tribes are down below uh kind of in the western region of- they, are. they are they're all from the um the what they call the cliff dweller culture in that region and, and that's how like those four states like you just said is how i like to group them as well because the anasazi they all come from that culture far back right i mean right. they're they're it's interesting i do like the southwest it's it's very unique in its, right. in its own way right it's very like new mexico when you're there you're like this is southwest like, this is this is a textbook like southwest Oh, exactly. And you look at and you get that feel and you have the Pueblos there, which even kind of varies from like the Arizona tribes, um, which, you know, is interesting because you even like you look at like the casinos down in the Southwest that you have. And the fact that like there's no open gaming or any any of those kind of things going on in those states. So those casinos can thrive and, and grow large. So like people think like you go down like Sandia Pueblo and Albuquerque, they're like you're saying it's it, it's textbook southwest it's a resort in the desert you know what i mean in a, in a way i uh, think um another part of the southwest i've noticed is is like look at those tribes in southern arizona like the tohono odom that along the border there you could argue almost that like and then i'm going to use the apache on the other end you could argue the tribes down there were either more of a desert people or more of a mountain people and I would argue the Apaches were a little more of a mountain people. Right. The sense of like, they they did hunt elk in those mountains and they didn't farm as much as like the Pima and the Tohono O'odham were more farmers and, you know, desert you know, like gatherers. Well, you yeah. had, like you're saying, like you had those like valleys and then you have those mountains because like people don't really, like they, they forget that how high that desert is down in those areas like the elevation as well as this the how many mountains there are even um like you're saying so you kind of get yeah like those different kind of cultures and even the blend of those cultures um because like the navajo for example yeah they grew a lot of corn uh they they had sheep farms on those cliffs up in the in the monument valley and stuff um and then from there you know i'll go north and talk we'll talk great plains a little bit and you know you have your montana you have your Wyoming, your North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, and that's kind of the northern part of the plains when you you group them together northern. And then you got your Kansas, your Oklahomas, uh, your Missouris. Um, like you could say Texas is southern plains as well, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. The problem is, is there's not a lot of tribes in Texas for how big it is. You know, like I feel like that was another one of those countries. And we had this conversation earlier about like how. Mexico kind of just tried to wipe out its native people. Like there's no reservations down there. Like it just tried to wipe them out. Mm. And Texas was its own country at one point, as well as it was a part of Mexico at one point during those periods. I I think Texas could almost be its own podcast because of what it was. (laughs) How complicated. Yeah. And it will be one day on this podcast. (laughs) The topic we're going to put it down on the thing because I think you're absolutely right. It's it's interesting because of like how the native culture was involved there as well. But from there, you know, and, and I kind of call that area, you know, when you call the Southern Plains, if you really break down the Oklahoma area, because Oklahoma is kind of unique in its own way. Um, but a lot of those tribes in Kansas and Nebraska, like lower Nebraska, Missouri, those kind of ones, Iowa, they kind of have those connections to Oklahoma, like the Haskell University and uh, the tribes there, you know, it's a lot of like sister tribes and stuff. well, and like, like with work being at these powwow events the last few months, right? Like right away, just just you hear someone talk and you're like, oh, they're from Oklahoma. Just right. by the way they talk, like it's yeah. closer to the south, and like it has that has that twang, right? Like, well, and and exactly, and it's interesting how like you when you start looking at these regions where where people kind of travel 
in the smaller region within like the like if you talk about the northwest southwest plains wherever like within that region and then the regions bordering like you're saying like an oklahoma region person will go to like a denver march powwow as well as like a uh gathering of nations on a regular basis but not necessarily go to a Stanford powwow on a regular basis because it's over in the California area, but you have like those California natives. But right. California is also interesting because you get into the urban areas with the Indian Relocation Act, which is a whole, whole episode of its own, probably a series. Um, and, and right now we're just talking regions. But from there, I guess we'll go over to the Great Lakes. You know, you have your Minnesota, your Michigan, your Wisconsin, kind of Ohio, Indiana, you know, you start kind of getting into the interesting uh, with those tribes, especially down in like, not necessarily on the Great Lakes, those tribes. Because right. um, again, that's another part of the country where a lot of tribes were wiped out um, in, in many ways and with many atrocities. I mean, there's still people there. Uh, there's still some like state recognized tribes, not as many federal tribes kind of in that Midwestern, middle USA, South kind of area. Well, and a lot of them obviously were removed to Oklahoma too. So it's like the Ohio, Indiana ones are interesting because there are some folks still there. Cleveland, right. Cleveland was a was a relocation city right. in the origin of AIM and all that. So right. Well, exactly. And you have Chicago too up in that area. So you have like the urban populations, and then you have like you're saying the Oklahoma populations that like got pushed there so you don't really have like governing native land or governing native bodies in this area which is interesting the great lakes area though you do yeah uh, up in that but like in this other area you kind of don't so they get kind of grouped into i think the larger eastern section which is basically you you hear like it's basically like the east over the whole, the whole yeah. eastern united states yeah. and yeah. i look at that and i'm like well i like to break that down into the northeast because you have like the new england tribes New York's kind of its own unique thing, uh, especially when you look at like upstate New York. And then you get into like even I could you could call consider some of those Iroquois tribes like part of the Great Lakes in yeah. a way, but they're almost but they're, I yeah. the ones that were part of that Confederacy in New York, the Seneca, Cayuga, Cayuga the Onondaga. The, the, the Iroquois one like we're just like Iroquois New York like that's how we refer to those six groups right like right and they're large groups and they are, are. kind of I kind of consider them in that Great Lakes area because of just like the culture around those Great Lakes that those tribes offered but you can also throw them in that northeast because of like a state of how the state of New York is you know because it's kind of different you don't really have the tribes in Pennsylvania you have ones in like Rhode Island and Massachusetts, but they're very kind of urban in that those ways, just based on how the East Coast was developed. Well, and they're small too, like um, some of those ones in Virginia and that Mid Atlantic as well. That are um, it's interesting with them that all right. the, you know, and then like we always like point out like the kind of the big three areas in the East. We always say are like the Iroquois groups in the New York, the like Eastern Cherokee, North Carolina, right. and like your Seminoles in Florida. Those are kind of like, we call them the big, I don't know if you call them the big three, but then there's the smaller groups in between, right? Like, I, right. And I, I like, I like kind of like it in anyway. <laughs> the East in that sense, because you, you're right. Like even the, the tribes up in Maine are kind of small. Um, and, and, you know, and the organizations are just set up different where it's like out, out the regional organizations out West that you have like the Portland area Indian health board, you know, uh, the chief Seattle club, like the way they've kind of set up. I mean, not to say that the East doesn't have that, you know, they have, there's a native restaurant in Rhode Island, but right. when you're looking at these larger cultural groups who really have all, like a, an effect and role on the po local politics, even in the areas like the Seminoles have, big pole down in Florida, the, oh, nice. the, uh, you know, or Iroquois have big pole up in, in upper New York with, with some of the stuff that, you know, if, if they want to oppose something, they can get, get the people to back them. You know what I mean? Like when, it, especially right. like land stuff. Um, and then you're right. Like when you look at that North Carolina, the Cherokee, you could argue kind of the Lumbee as a state tribe um, are kind of loud, but in that in that regard where like they, they make noise um but really, yeah the, that's why we were considering north carolina and like that's that's indian country 
you have you have enough natives there with like with the Lumbee and Eastern Cherokee. It's like there's a significant population there, you know, right? Get forgotten about a little bit, but no, and it's good and it's good to have and it's good to see that those populations are doing well. Um, it's just you know, because like you look at like Louisiana, you look at like uh, I'm trying to think, you have the I'm, I'm blanking. I'm oh, blanking. The, you're talking about the Homa, the Homa, and then there's the other oh. one. And, uh, uh, Chini matcha. Chini matcha, yes thank you i, I knew it started with a c <laughs> um those two tribes down there like they're they're just smaller they're just smaller tribes but they're there they're living in the bayou they're present you know what i mean um so well, they were very like it's funny you brought that up hurricane katrina right right heard a lot of and this is in no disregard to the black community but you heard the voice voices of the black community when Hurricane Katrina. But what right. about all those tribes that got hit along that Louisiana coast? Some of them had to rebuild their whole community. Some are exactly. only recognized. No exactly. rising has affected those groups. And they didn't, yeah. There some of them aren't like you're saying, they're not federally. When you say they're state recognized, that means they're not federally recognized. And I like, so I kind of like where the conversation's headed now, because you're kind of right. There's some terminology here that we're using that not everyone might understand. And part of that is like federally recognized tribes are tribes that the federal government said, yes, we recognize you as a tribe. You are basically a sovereign nation. Here are your rights because you signed treaties with us. Um, going back to treaties, those are the only things signed between native tribes in the U.S., as well as tr things that, you know, tr other entities at war countries like you sign different treaties the treaty of versailles etc you know and part of that is establishing the native land as federal land part of the agreements of what the u.s and tribes have come to so each tribe has different treaty laws and rights because of what they agree to based on each treaty like the little shell for example we're tied into a treaty signed at turtle mountain in north dakota um, so there's just various little things like that, that uh, yeah. like you, you hear like the, the treaty of Lar Laramie. Uh, for, yeah. Ours is Fort Laramie. So yeah. You know, which is, it involves a lot of tribes. Oh, several, several, you know, but that's also why certain tribes can come hunt bison in Yellowstone is that is the Fort Laramie treaty as well. That Colville tribe, or I might be thinking of a different one. No, no, yeah, it's it's the it's the Sioux, Cheyenne, Arapaho. Uh, I think I think Fort Wayne, yeah, those three. It's the one with the Black Hills is ours, like that that with a little bit of Wyoming and a little Eastern Montana is in that too. Right, right. And, so there's, um, and then there's one that the the is tied into the Three Forks hunting ground, which yes, is all that's Fort a different. Laramie. That's like a different also one. Also, Fort Laramie, I want to say. Yeah, it's different. <laughs> that's but, a little further yeah. west. Yeah. But, and so that's that's the federal. They did that. State right. is they didn't necessarily have that. And they're rec but however, different states recognize California has state recognized tribes. Mm -hmm. uh, like we said, the Lumbee are a state recognized tribe. Um, and that's just like how you know the state of Virginia says, like, yep, we recognize you and we'll treat you that way. <laughs> different state exemptions. They're not exempt from different federal things or different federal laws and rules that apply uh to indian you know indian nations uh, in the US. on on treaties i wanted to hit on something you said a little bit ago um you know for the viewers treaties under the constitution are the law of the land treaties with indian nations in particular right it, but <laughs> well that's law but like how many times has that been broken right Right. And and this is where the, the native lawyers argue this, you know, for hunting rights and 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 it's like, but states really have not acknowledged. <laughs> right. No, exactly. And just, there's various different levels of the bureaucracies of like this treaty means we can do this. So you're giving us health care. So you're paying us this. But then when it comes to land, you're saying, no, we're taking it. And that's where, yeah, like you said, you bring in a lawyer and these guys got to fight it out because it's treaties have been broken since day one. And if you ever ask a native to trust the federal government, they're just going to laugh at you because 
they've been trusting them for years as <laughs> as a joke or but, like signing papers too with the old ones <laughs> like don't like signing papers very much exactly no you're exactly right it's interesting it really and they sticking needles in kids you know with vaccines back in the day just various different things that like you know from boarding schools all of it man you're just getting me go down a rope but we're not we're not going to talk about it. we're going to talk about the native land because we brought up native land and we talked about different tribes and kind of these tribal regions so i want to talk to you about the definition the difference because you'll hear people talk about reservations you'll hear them talk about rancherias pueblos Alaska villages and corporations, native trust lands, Oklahoma tribal statistical areas, and Indian colonies. And each one of these are just different uh, aspects of Indian country. And kind of when you talk about like, oh, natives live on a reservation, they offer a reservation, it really depends on where they're at in the world. Because like, half of the tribes are located in Alaska and none of them, there's not a re single reservation out there, <laughs> you know? So when you look at it, um, we talk about rancherias, right? There's 59 of them today. They're in California. Um, it's a Spanish term for small Indian settlements. Rancherias are a particular California institution, a small area of land was set aside around an Indian settlement to create a rancheria. Some rancherias developed from small communities of Indians formed on the outskirts of American settlements who were fleeing Americans or avoiding the removal to reservations. With passage of public law 83280 in the mid 1950s, terminating federal supervision and control over California tribes, some 40 rancherias lost the right to certain federal programs and their lands no longer had the protection of federal status. In eight, 1983, a lawsuit resulted in restoring federal recognition to 17 rancherias, with others still waiting for the reversal of their termination. And that's kind of referencing the state recognized tribes there in California. Um, so a lot of these tribes, and you meet these people, man, they're native as, they're native as hell. They're, and arguably, being at that Stanford Powell, I was like, man, some of these California natives are kind of militant. <laughs> Very <laughs> much militant. hardcore. But you're talking the 80s. That's like, like when I look at my dad, that's when he's growing up is in the 80s there, right? So you're talking like my grandpa and stuff, like things in their lives happening, like in the and the, being taken away, taken off roles, this and that. And that's a whole nother thing. Well, so, and I wanted to say on Rancheria, so for the viewers, um, I look this up, the smallest tribal community in the United States is in California. It's called the Chicken Rancheria and they are Miwok Indians. They're east of Sacramento up in the foothills of the Sierras. And uh, yeah, 15 tribal members. Wow, that's a whole family. <laughs> I mean, they might be more now, you know, have a few kids and it's right. like, like two families or something left. But, but that's like what you're saying is they're the Miwok people, right? And it's interesting because you look at like just Manifest Destiny and how the white man really tried to wipe out natives. And and creating even just different names like that. Where you live at the chicken rancheria, not you're a Miwok of this branch, you know, like the Chippewa over here, you know, that uh, in a way, you know, make you different, single you out to get rid of you versus give you a way to, you know, oh, all these Pueblos have the same name. All these rancherias have the same, you know. Yeah, no, I argue they're probably not chickens if they fought for 15 people still around, you know, like. They probably yeah. dealt with the gold miners and everything. But you take the numbers of some of those California tribes and what they've like gone through, like you're talking thousands of people down to 15. You know what I mean? Like that's right. that's crazy. Um, another one we're going to get into is Pueblo. So you'll hear Pueblos. Uh, a lot of most of them, the majority of them, I believe 19 of them are in New Mexico. Um, there's 21 in total. Uh on the on the central Spanish meseta. In the unit of settlement was as the Pueblo, which is to say a large nucleated village surrounded by its own fields with no outlying farms, separate, separated from its neighbors by some considerable distance, sometimes as much as 10 miles or so. The demands of agrarian routine and the need for defense, the simple desire for humane society and the vast solitude dictated that so that it should be so. Nowadays, Pueblo might have the population running into the thousands. 
doubtless they were much smaller in the mid, mid early middle ages but but we should probably not be far wrong if we think of them as having populations of some hundreds i would argue some of those like you go up to mesa verde man that you you can get into the thousands in those pueblo villages too right but basically they're the, the the farms the farming native communities in the valleys in the in the southwest um you have some in arizona as well as texas but mainly in the new mexico area yeah. um, like taos pueblo if you want to google one real quick taos pueblo is kind of a famous one you see kind of for its architecture uh it's the adobe houses living on top of one another um so essentially when these lands were set aside they were set aside basically like you're already kind of living here. We're just going to give you that land. Well, Taos is the longest inhabited village within the continental United States. Oh, wow. And so, yeah, like Zach was saying, the farm, I mean, they lived kind of along the Rio Grande, more in the northern part of New Mexico. Um, very, very, uh, very unique to that region, arguably. Very like, um, yeah. But it makes sense too when you when you talk about the weathers in that region, the the high desert, uh, the winters as well as the summers, and some of those like house gets snow. You're at seven thousand feet, you know. Yeah, <laughs> like it's crazy. Um, other another one is Indian reservation. Uh, they're called reserves up in Canada. Um, it's an area of land held and governed by the U.S. federal government, recognized Native American tribal nation, whose government is is semi-sovereign so when you hear the sovereignty right this travel so it's semi-sovereign because of uh the regulations passed by the u.s congress and administered by the united states bureau of indian affairs and how they regulate the tribe uh so there's 574 federal uh recognized tribes and they govern 326 indian reservations so not all the tribes have a reservation some of the tribes share a reservation when you talk like shoshone arapaho sharing the wind river um, some of them have different councils that govern. They have different terms, council member, chief, chairman, uh, different terminologies they may use. Um, while some re share reservations and others have no reservation at all, historical peace, piecemeal land allocations under the Dawes Act facilitated sales to non-Native Americans, resulting in some reservations becoming severely fragmented or checkerboarded, as we like to call it. Uh, with pieces of tribal land privately held and land being treated separately uh, it, as separate enclaves. The jumble of private and public real estate creates significant administrative, political, and legal difficulties. Uh, I've heard people in Wolf Point will get pulled over in their police car or by by like a high, Montana Highway Patrol, and they'll say, I want a tribal cop. And they the Highway Patrol can't do anything because essentially a tribal cop has authority over a tribal citizen on tribal land. So there's all sorts of just loopholes and bullshit that that comes of it. So reservations are interesting. That's kind of the, one of the most common ones you see. Uh, the next common one I would argue is the Alaska Corporation or Village. Um, in 1971, the U.S. Congress passed the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, divided Alaska into 12 geographic locations. Alaska natives then organized a regional corporation for each region. Uh, those corporations were authorized to select lands that would become their fee simple property. Each region also contains a, num a, a numerous small village corporations, about 225 in all. The village corporations selected the surface lands around their villages. Uh, the An Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act required every corporation to be organized under Alaska law. In addition, a 13th regional corporation was subsequently formed for non-resident Alaska natives. So there's the different basically business corporations that operate the land, the waterways, the oil rights, the different things. So when you hear about AFN and you hear about these corporations leaving the Alaska Federation of Natives uh, Conference and the their their different organizations up there. It's it's a lot larger because these corporations are made up of all those little tiny villages, and all those little tiny villages are in these corporations, and they have different policies of who's elected leaders, and that uh, that vary between each one as well. <laughs> Alaska is very unique in that way. Um, I did want to say there actually is one reservation in Alaska, and it's in the southeast. 
part of Alaska. It makes it, sense where it would be. Yeah, yeah, and it's small. I think it's called EAC um, Indian Reservation, but they're the like similar to Oklahoma in that sense, where you're probably getting into that next. But with the Osage being the one reservation, right? And, and it's kind of got pushed there. Yeah, seeing like the histories on those, but yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. The, the 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 Oklahoma tribal statistical area, right? So when you hear about Oklahoma, the land of dumping the natives, exactly, there's one reservation, the Osage. And that movie, uh, Killers of the Wildflower Moon, is Killers coming. Killers of the Flower Moon. Flower Moon. Flower Moon. Yeah. 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 That one's coming out. It's about the Osage. It looks really good. And that, that has some history in the sense of how it's tied to the formation of the Osage Nation. Um, but when you get into o Oklahoma tribal statistical areas, it is a statistical entity identified and delineated by federally recognized American Indian tribes in Oklahoma as part of the U.S. Census Bureau's 2010 Census and Ongoing American Community Survey. Many of these areas are also designated tribal jurisdictional areas, areas within which tribes will provide governmental services such as health and other like recreation, even you know, you'll see like a health center. Um, such as the Osage Nation of Oklahoma, not listed below, in the allotment was broken up and as a consequence of their residents are a mix of Native and non-Native people, with only tribal members subject to the tribal government. At least five of these, er of these areas, those so-called so the five civilized tribes of Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, and Seminole, the five tribes of Oklahoma, which cover 43% of the area of the state, including Tulsa are recognized as reservations by federal treaty and thus not subject to state law or jurisdictional for tribal members. So it's just a different different law, different ways of how things are, because you have normal people, not, I shouldn't say normal people. <laughs> You're one, non-natives. <laughs> but non-natives, whites, not no, normal na U.S. citizens not dealing with the native process. Right. <laughs> um it's interesting um well oklahoma i mean oklahoma has such a history of like racial <laughs> discrimination and i mean in the black community is fairly good size there as well with the tulsa race riot so you tie that in and it's like it's got a wild history <laughs> no it, it really it's, it's interesting um because like you said there's the one reservation but there's all this tribal land area and these tribal offices and tribal organizations that are you know spread throughout and kind of all over um in the, these areas too in the tribal members spread out um the last one kind of that we get into is the indian colonies there's 16 of those uh, most of them are in nevada um, an indian colony is a native american settlement associated with an urban area although some of them become official became official indian reservations they differ from most reservations in that they are placed where Native Americans could find employment in mainstream America. Um, many were originally formed without federal encouragement or sanctions. So they began without that. Uh, Indian colonies are especially common in Nevada. As the Great Basin ecosystem is very fragile, Native lifeways because of the untenable soon after, as Native lifeways became untenable soon after white settlement due to li livestock overgrazing, water diversion, and the felling of the pinyon pine groves. At that time, there were few official reservations in the area, and those were terribly run even by contemporary standards. Many Native Americans chose instead to seek jobs in white ranches, farms, and cities. The areas in which they settled became known as Indian camps or colonies. In some cases, they owned land they settled on. In other cases, they settled on public land, starting in the early 20th century. The federal government began establishing Indian trust territories for the colonies on public land. Following the Indian Recognization Reorganization Act of 1934, many of the Indian colonies gained federal recognition as tribes. Many of the tribes formed this way are, are unusual in that they include members from different nations. For example, Reno Sparks Indian Colony has members for, with Washoe, Paiute, and Shoshone heritage. Yeah, it, it's interesting with the colonies there i actually know someone who just got housing in one of those washoe colonies around reno yeah there are several of them there's like if you drive from carson city reno mindenville south of there to the sierra uh, the east side of the sierras 
they're every they're everywhere like these little colonies around that region so right no it's it's interesting and that's kind of when you look at indian country where they live the terminologies of where they live how they live and kind of get into it but again you ask yourself what is that question that that overall question what is a native american did you know there's a new native apparel company no i did not it's called shop ls 574 named after the 574 federal tribes and the little shell descendancy of its founders wow that's really cool man it is it is becoming a spot to order native apparel by and for natives working with native designers and teams to help best represent Indian country. That's awesome, dude. For sure. Now make sure to go pick up some a native podcast swag as well as other native gear while shopping at shopls574.com. Oh yeah. And do not forget to use code ANP10 to save on your next order. That's ANP10. Hey, Matt, did you know there's a tribally owned net company? No, I did not. Not only are they tribally owned, but Blue Ribbon Nets also creates totally sustainable products. With Blue Ribbon Nets, not only are you getting quality nets, but even eco-friendly ones as well. That's awesome, dude. It sure is indeed. Make sure to use code RUGARU10 on your next Blue Ribbon Net order to save. Again, the code is RUGARU10, R-U-G-A-R-U-1-0. I am definitely getting a Blue Ribbon Net now. Tune in every Tuesday to hear your favorite native podcast. That's right. A Native Podcast has new episodes every week, ranging from boarding schools to Indian child welfare. Not only that, but we have Indian country covered from Maine to California and Florida to Alaska, Hopi to Blackfeet and Choctaw to Clinkett, and all those Crees in between. And all you other natives and non-natives out there, we want to remind you to tune in this Tuesday to A Native Podcast. Is your res runner in need of new lights? Well, look no further than our friends at Oxteo an industry leader in LED lights. Make sure to use code RUGARU on your next set of lights. That's R-U-G-A-R-U. And now, music on A Native Podcast with Matt and Zach. This week's song is brought to you by Taboo of Black Eyed Peas, Tony Duncan, Perry Shaviers, PJ Vegas, Kara Hodges, MC1, Dreesus, Superman, Gerald Danforth, Spencer Battiest, Doc Battiest, and my verse. Martin Sensimir, Bethany Yellowtail, Leah Thunderboy Siegel, Shalane Joseph, Trimus Lane, Gina Tiger, Indigenous Enterprise, and Jacasa Media Group. Stand up, stand in rock, no dapple. They call it a pipeline, but those on the front lines know that black snake was sent for us to grow, to shed the skin our ancestors pray, of wounds old and calloused, so that we may stay, so that we may unite, Unity our tool. No weapons are found in this court of rule. Men becoming ki'a'i, steadfast in their guard, protecting women's hearts as their song become roots. Roots to cast out healing for all sentient beings. To honor sacred mother, heart forward we heal. The salmon will run, the mauna will breathe, the rivers will flow. The rainbow is here and prophecy tells us all generations will hear. Nations and our people that been living here for thousands of years. Stand up. We've been fighting for our freedom since the Nina and the Pinta and the Santa Maria. Stand up. Like Geronimo, Sitting Bull, Red Cloud, Crazy Horse, Leonard Peltier. Stand up. Now they poison in the waters for our sons and our daughters, so we on the frontier. We won. One nation, one cause, one people, one tribe. Now it's us against the pipeline. Get on your feet for Stanley Rock, and we'll show you how strong we could be when we unify. To all my native people, recognize yourself, keep your head up. To all my tribal people, recognize yourself, keep your head up.
planet Earth has been spinning, we've been living and dying, but giving birth the first of many nations. Celebrating them days when all that got made came after what got me. These days we cater to these internet memes, internet streams. It seems them streams aren't clean. We need the whole story seen. We're hassling before water has gasoline in it. Malcolm X moment, Martin Luther King with a dream and war bone. Wounded knee plus Alcatraz dog on it. This is for the rock with prayers we stand on it. Oh yeah, we playing on it. The earth we camp on it. In a sweat lodge, singing our songs with grandfather's heat rocks all in the spot. We splash on them with a beatbox from my boy B Jam on it. Said a prayer for the black snake killers. Train on the front lines, they you're the realest. Stand for your people, stand for your family. Stand with standing rock, stand for humanity. It takes a group of people who actually care about. You know, Mother Earth and life and water being sacred and the land being sacred to say we stand up. To all my native people, recognize yourself, keep your head up. To all my tribal people, recognize yourself, keep your head up. To all my native people, to all the original people, to all my indigenous people, recognize yourself, keep your head up. Mini Wachoni, water is life. Mini Wachoni. Water, water is life. Water is life. Water is life. Water is life. I stand. I stand. I stand with standing rock. I stand with standing rock. I stand with standing rock. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. I stand with standing rock. Stand up. To all my native people, woke up the giant. We won't go quiet. To all my tribal people, don't mistake our peace as we stand and fight. To all my native people, it's the calm before the storming. I can hear it coming. To all my tribal people, I'm ready for the battle when we ain't running. Stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. Is on a sad repeat. Is it liberty or we just acting free? As our land depletes from these hands of greed. See, fate is found. How we face the hounds. Take a vow for these sacred grounds. Make a sound that'll shake us out. Say aloud, what can save us now? And kind of get into it. But again, you ask yourself, what is that question? That that overall question, what is a Native American? You know, we talk about the federal status, the state status, you usually typically go to the federal status, that's kind of the like catch all that's kind of the accepted, I guess, terminology. And within that federal status, within that state status, even sometimes there's the blood quantum. And the blood quantum, I mean, we could dedicate a whole episode to this, I'm not going to. Um, that's how much of your blood is American Indian or Native American. Um, and there's there's a lot of history. There's a lot of negative history, positive history with this for certain people, certain tribes. Um, I'm just going to kind of get into the definitions and examples here, and then I'll let Matt, you kind of just piggyback off kind of what I have to say here. Uh, the example, for instance, the Omaha tribe of Nebraska requires a blood quantum of one-fourth Native American descent from a registered ancestor for enrollment, while the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma has no blood quantum requirement and only requires lineal descent from a documented Cherokee ancestor listed on the Dawes rolls, a specific census role that is still upheld racist stereotypes and blood quantum theories, and that, and that supersedes other older roles. Um, and that's a whole can of worms, the Dawes rolls, uh, when you get into the Dawes Act and all that. Um, others use a, a tiered system with the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma using a lineal descent for general enrollment but requiring a blood quantum of at least one fourth for all tribal council candidates. Um, the establishment of the blood quantum is the concept of blood quantum was not widely applied by the United States government until the Re Indian Reorganization Act of 1934. At this time, the federal government required persons to have certain blood quantum to be recognized as Native American and thus be eligible for financial and other benefits under treaty treaties or sales of land. Um, they say benefits, but they just 
<laughs> call them <laughs> call them rights but <laughs> are, again it's the public federal government giving is, you those is, is that a joke <laughs> yeah. yeah um history so here's some history in 1705 the colony of virginia adopted the indian blood law that limited civil rights of native americans and persons of one half or more native american ancestry this also had the effect of regulating who would be classified as Native American. In the 19th century and 20th centuries, the U.S. government believed tribal members had to be defined for the purposes of federal benefits and annuities paid under treaty resulting from land cessations. According to the Pocahontas Clause of the Racial Integrity Act of 1924, a white person in Virginia could have a maximum blood quantum of 1 16th Indian ancestry without losing his or her legal status as white. So that Pocahontas Clause, so we'll get into it. The Racial Integrity Act was subject to the Pocahontas Clause or Pocahontas Exemption, which allowed people with claims of less than 1 16th American ancestry to still be considered white, despite the otherwise underlying climate of the one drop rule in politics at that time. The exception regarding native blood quantum was included as an amendment to the original act in response to concerns of Virginia elites, including many of the first families of Virginia who had always claimed descent from Pocahontas with pride, but now worried that the new legislation would jeopardize their status. The exemption stated, it shall therefore be unlawful for any white person in this state to marry any, sa marry any save a white person or a person with no other admixture of blood than white and American Indian. For the purpose of this act, the term white person shall apply to the person who has no trace of whatsoever of any blood other than Caucasian, but persons who have one sixteenth or less of the blood of American Indian and have no other Caucastic blood shall be deemed to be white persons. While the definition of Indian and colored and variations of these were established altered throughout the 18th and 19th centuries, this was the first direct case of which itself is being defined officially. So it goes all the way back to that when you talk about blood quantums. Um, I, I, yeah, go ahead if you have anything quick to say. Yeah, it, I was just, when you got into benefits, I was like, <laughs> I just lost it because I, I, I really, it's interesting with blood quantum because of, uh, you know, we'll probably get into an episode on the whole pretendian issue and folks that aren't native claiming it for so-called benefits, but you know, the blood quantum is interesting. Some tribes I know have lowered their blood quantum for political purposes. Uh, the Klamath tribes in Oregon, they lowered theirs from a 16th to an 8th in the last few years because they were fighting water wars. So if you're a larger political entity, lowering the blood quantum would benefit you because yeah. they're a bigger group. Yeah. Well, right. not only that, but you even... even take like some of tribes it's like how you, before you get inbred you know what i mean before we do the before we do the white thing and get inbred no just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what i mean is like you, you kind of you not you know how many of us have had that conversation okay so you're my cousin this cousin that cousin too many too many of you natives i know it so <laughs> well, so, then, yeah. <laughs> unfortunately unfortunately <laughs> no um, the other part I wanted to add real quick is like the 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 benefits thing. Like again, we could go in further into this another time, but this people think natives get a lot of things for free, right? And it's like, you know, I don't know if you have bragging rights when you have access to Indian Health Service because it's not always the best quality of care. It's more by obligation because of treaty, right? um the tax thing the like free school it's like you know I, someone might know that guy that's from one of those california tribes and gets all his school paid for and gets all the you know and but that's such a small percentage of indian country that receives those things you know what right I mean? those are kind of those stereotypes that you're talking about you know we all don't look the same we all don't dress the same we all don't do even our traditions the same you know the northwest has salmon culture the plains has a buffalo culture right there's all these different aspects you know and when you talk even blood quantum because people are like well are you enough indian to get money well that depends does your tribe own a casino 
Do they own a profitable casino? Do they own a rock quarry? Do they own a smoke shop? Do they have museums, food stores? Are they located in an area that is around a large urban center? You know, there's various different things that go into these enterprises because that's what these are. These are tribal enterprises. This is the tribes are basically a business that own different businesses and, and operate and manage them. That's a government, you know, because they're also doing the governmental stuff too. Um, but when you talk about getting money, part of that is from those things, you know, killers of the, the flower moons going to talk about how probably the Osage get some of their uh, checks and whatnot that if, if they, if they even get checks, I don't even know that, you know, I got to do my research there, but that's the thing is, is they come from certain entities and then you have certain tribal councils even that take advantage of those, that they don't pay out their citizens, even though the tribal enterprise is making money. So there's all these different things. So when you're like, what is a Native American? It's it's a person living in the US who has indigenous roots. And really the only similarities that we have is we all got our commodity food on the reservation. So that's why we love that fry bread. We love to dance because they tried to take that aspect of our culture away. So that's why our powwows are strong. Um, we love our land and we will fight for it. Standing Rock showed you that. Thacker Pass, as Matt was talking about. Uh, that's a thing coming up. You know, keep an eye on that. Or if it's passed, it's passed. But that's something that's big. You know, we all have IHS. We all love good old Indian Health Services. They all treat us the same across the board. We all love the show Res Dogs as they do great <laughs> in Indian country. And we all love one another. We love our families. We're very family oriented people. Uh, we believe in having a healthy mind, body, and spirit because that is huge to Indian country. That is, you know, if you're healthy in the mind, you're healthy with your body, you're healthy everywhere else, you're living a good life, you know. And that's one thing we need to do. Um, last kind of thing before I'll get get us into our final words here, Matt, but I didn't talk about native trust lands. Mm. Native trust lands are those lands which the title is held in trust by the U.S. for benefit of the American Indian tribe or the benefit of American Indian individual. Uh, the Supreme Court affirmed that the trust land qualifies as a reservation if it has been validly set apart for the use of the tribes. Therefore, the land held in trust for the benefit of a federally recognized tribe would meet the would meet the definition of reservation for FDPIR purposes. However, land held in trust for an American Indian individual does not qualify for reservation. So the tribe has to own the trust land, the person can't. And that's why you had all these different buyback programs happening as well. Uh, so land is interesting. You know, there's so many things that makes us a Native American. Um, we kind of talked a little bit about them today. Matt, is there any kind of what makes a Native American thing hanging over uh, your head? No, I mean, it, we hit on a lot of stuff uh, today. I think, you know, like Zach said, we have like kind of these core, larger, almost sometimes pan-Indian things that we've, we, you know, powwows and things that connect all of us. But I mean, you could have two tribes close to each other that have some differences. And the example I'm going to use here, I wanted to bring up was right here in Oregon, Grand Ronde and Warm Springs. Because you could argue Grand Ronde is more of the Northwest Coast culture and Warm Springs is Plateau culture. And the interesting thing is you visit these two communities, they look completely different. One's economically more well off, not going to say the word rich. The other one is not as well off and they're referred to as the res, right? So when right. I said reservations, there's 300 and some. They're both fully recognized. Uh, yeah. Yeah, they're both federal tribes, but when we use the term res, right, we're referring to those reservation communities as the res. And what's the, what's the, and then what's the difference here? Like you're saying, what's the difference, you know, that the fact that Grand Ronde had the I-5 corridor built right there in right. the valley right there. I mean, yes, that's your land that's getting sucked. So like, it makes sense. You're, you're, you should be allowed to build a casino on it. Well, some it. just got the short end of the stick. In, exactly. that, in that regard and that's all that is i mean right and yeah. we're dealing with that today yeah and and it creates divides and then you get yeah it's a whole thing <laughs> so well uh, with that being said my guy i gotta ask you any final words 
Uh, I think, you know, I think for, for the viewers that, you know, are kind of learning for the first time, like most people are open-minded if, if you ask questions, like right. from, from a good place and not from making assumptions like, oh, do you get money or you're enough native to go to school for free or whatever, you know? Right. Um, yeah, there, there's a there's a lot of misconceptions when it comes to Native Americans. So, no, I like that. I I like that. That's definitely something that is true. Like you, you or I, like we don't mind people asking questions. Like when they're coming at us respectfully. Like yeah, like we'll educate you. You know. Well, and it's interesting too because you know I don't look Native. You know that's something we didn't get into really today because we don't look the same, right? We are we're not all the red skinned, beautiful, black haired. <laughs> men running around with our tan buckskin hides no uh we have you know i have blue eyes brown hair there's yeah. blonde hair folk there's red hair folk because tribes had you know we were forced to assimilate some of us are biracial in that sense um nothing we can do about it we can't control what our parents did um you know but we're here and we have that common goal of what our culture is and what that represents and we understand that um and 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 that's part of it too is you know we do get i think we do get those questions sometimes because people don't necessarily believe us that we are you know me for sure i get that all the time they don't believe me that i'm native but then i i i get it depending on the time of year or <laughs> <laughs> summer you're good times come in it's like okay <laughs> right but that's one of those questions and I've, I've dealt with it my whole life and and it's it is what it is right it's always going to be there but at the end of the day, you know who you are, you know where you come from, you know what your family values are, you know what your family taught you. Um, and that goes for all of us in Indian country. And 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 when you look at truly, I think those simul similarities like we're talking about, you know, that there's there's one that I think stands out is the love for this land, the love for our North American native land, the, the way to keep it right and to live with it. Um, and that's something that we just need to keep doing. And until next time, Thank you for listening. Bye bye. I know, I know ballers, I know chiefs, I know riders from the east. I know educated natives down to pick it in the streets. Middle fingers to police. Fuck you, we come in peace. I know red skin hippies that be giving me the creeps. I know beauty, I know beast, I know savages and freaks. And I know a couple cousins even bougier than me. No, 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 ain't a leak. Bougie native, yes indeed. Art exhibit to the club, and we roll it 20 D. Copper on my neck. Gold on my ring, feather on my hat, skin stitch ching. Hundred warriors on my back, daily drumming when I sing. Man, there ain't no way around it. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a. a native podcast is produced by Gingy Advertising and Quartz Lake Productions.